I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight for the Paulet Firehouse debate. I will leave the introductions of uh, the candidates to our moderator, John Thrasher. At this point, I wanted to tell you this is being filmed for GNAT Public Television. It will be released to others such as PEG TV. It will take about five days to get out. But comb your hair good, make sure it looks fine, because we're ready, we're ready to roll. Um, this is an, what I would call an interactive event. And the questions that we are going to start with, that will take most of this time, have come from either select board members or listers or board of civil authority members from the five towns that comprise our district. I want to thank everyone who did participate and give us questions. It will make it a lot more interesting. John Thrasher is uh, making sure that we have no innuendos or anything, you know, no remarks about uh, Paula being the best town or Tinmouth be having the best acoustics in their firehouse. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, this is a civil debate. So, you know, little mild groans or cheers, uh, just kind of keep them to yourself because we have a lot to cover tonight. And the other thing is, these people are really good sports to come out so that the voters, and I organized this for you. This is for the voters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. You will have an opportunity after the regular debate questions that have come from the town officials. It will be opened up to the audience for questions as time allows. At the end of this debate part, there will be an opportunity for anyone running for office, regardless of your town, regardless of your area, even if you came from the Northeast Kingdom, you are welcome to tell us who you are and the office you're running for. As usual, we have some people to thank. Number one, the Fire Department of Paula, and if there are any firemen here, I would ask them to start by standing up, and they probably won't want to. The next people The next people, anyone who is on a police force. We have one already standing, Dave Ricard. Call it Constable, and the West Side is the best side, as we say. He's a fellow member of or resident of West Pollock, as I am. <laughs> and last, and as I said, if we will stand, because then Dave Ricard is going to lead us in the pledge. But if you have been in the U.S. military at any point in your life, we thank you, and please, you can be the first to stand as we start our pledge. So anyway, I know there's some veterans here. I think all rise. All rise. Thank you, and Dave will lead us off in a very loud voice, hopefully. Is that you, Dave? Add, please. Okay. Add, add.
So here we are at the world of great technology. I'm going to turn this event over to John Thrasher, who is an impeccable questioner. So here we go, folks. And thank you all for coming. Thank you for coming. Um, just to, We've gone through the rules with the two candidates, but just a reminder that this is a civil debate. Um, we ask that we keep the uh, comments from the floor with claps or boos or hiss to a minimum so that we get as much time getting substantive information from the candidates as possible. Um, we have a long tradition here in Vermont of debating issues at town meetings. We all know how to listen to the other side and respect the other side's position. And so let's carry on that tradition. Hopefully there'll be no interrupting, no outbursts. Let's give people an opportunity to answer the questions. We can agree or disagree. And we're here to help us decide if we agree or disagree with a particular candidate. Um, We've already flipped a coin to decide who's going to go first. I'm going to introduce the candidates in a minute, but uh, the format tonight is the candidates will have an opportunity to introduce themselves for a couple of minutes, then we'll start asking some questions. Um, we'll give each candidate uh, um, two minutes to um, respond to that question, and 30 seconds if there's any need, or a minute if there's any need, excuse me, a minute if there's any need to rebut. Um, we're asked to stay within the framework of each question to stay on topic. We'll try and cover as, as much as we can. Um, when we do get to the point, and if we do get to the point um, of asking questions from the floor, I'm going to ask you to stand up, ask your question in a loud voice. I'm going to repeat the question so that it gets onto the microphone, and then we'll give the candidates an opportunity to answer those questions. Um, then we'll give the candidates a um, couple of minutes to uh, give their closing remarks, and then we'll conclude the debate at approximately 8.15. So, uh, I'm gonna ask each candidate to uh, just raise their hand. On my right, I have Robin Chestnut Tangerman as the incumbent, he's running as a progressive Democrat. On my left, I have Jonas Rosenthal running as a Republican. Jonas won the flip of the coin, so, Jonas, you have the floor for two minutes to introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jonas Rosenthal. I'm currently the uh, Holding Town Manager and have been for the past 31 years, and hopefully tomorrow will be my last day. <laughs> um, that was my goal. But in any event, let me introduce, introduce myself to you. Uh, I'm originally from Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, born and raised. Uh, I went, uh, went to uh, high school. At, 1,200 folks, and uh, we had, I had a class of 444. I graduated in the top three-fifths of my class. And my, as my mom said, I was always at the bottom. <laughs> However, I did go on to the University of Maryland and received my uh, degree in business and public administration with a minor in economics. Um, I went from there to Penn State University, where I received my master's in recreation and parks. Um, after that, I, uh, in 1976, I moved to Montana. Um, worked in Warm Springs State Hospital for emotionally disturbed children. Um, uh, from there, I uh, went to uh, Butte, excuse me, Great Falls, Montana, to serve as the Big Brother and Sister Director. Um, in 19, so in 1978, I ran for the uh, State House of Representatives from Great Falls, Montana, was elected at age 28, so this is my, my first experience, but this, uh, this will be my first experience in Vermont. Um, I decided not to run again, and uh, I went to school, uh, went back to school at Montana State University, received my master's in public administration, um, and uh, in 1970, uh, 1982, I was hired by uh, Governor Ted Schwinnett, and I worked uh, in his office uh, for four months in the uh, Governor's Office of Budget Program Planning and worked on the staff uh, for a little over three years. And then I uh, moved to Vermont in 1985. I've been town manager ever since. Thank you. Good evening. 
Thank you for being here. Uh, my introduction will be less autobiographical and more about the job of a uh, representative. Thank you for being here tonight, uh, for participating in the job of making democracy work. And I thank Dolores for organizing and John for moderating. And Jed for hitting me when the fly swatter, with the fly swatter when the time is up. Um, but I'm here for the same reason that all of you are here, because we care about Vermont. Vermont is a special place. We have some very real challenges facing us, but we choose to make this our home. I know that every time I leave the state, when I come back across the border, I have that moment of, ah, home. It's a wonderful feeling. So there's a lot to celebrate here, not just the natural beauty of the state, but we have top-ranked education, we have top-ranked children's health and well-being in the state, we have strong communities, we have low crime, we have fabulous people, and we have a winter that makes us feel strong and virtuous every spring when we've gotten through it. <laughs> and I'm here tonight because I believe that I'm helping to solve our problems. I can't do that alone, no one individual can. But we can do it together. You know me as fair, as honest and open-minded, and you know that I have the temperament to sit down with anyone to solve problems listen to ideas, to look for creative solutions, find common sense, and overcome dogma and ideology. In my first term in the State House, I worked with progressives, with Democrats, with Republicans. I was recognized by the Democratic leadership, supported by progressives. And my first campaign contribution was from a Republican legislator who said, we need you back here. That's the kind of representation that we need in Montpelier. The work of a legislator is not enforcing codes and regulations or grant writing, but it's charting a vision for the ship of state 25 years down the road. We respond to immediate crisis, of course, but answers need to be long-term. It's not just balancing budgets and improving Madam charter changes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, but requires tenacity, flexibility, vision and practicality, collaboration, and leadership. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, according to the rules of the debate, the second person who got to introduce themselves gets to lead on the question. So the first question relates to a subject that has um, been in the forefront of our community um, lately, and that's Act 46, and uh, what do we do in response to Act 46 in our local communities? I'm going to ask that we break this question out into two parts and to give you an opportunity to respond for two minutes on each part. Uh, the first is Act 46 overall, and the second is to address more specifically um, school choice versus designation. So uh, if you wouldn't mind addressing what your position is on Act 46, we would appreciate it. So as I've been going around knocking on doors, talking to the constituents, the main uh, item on the table seems to be Act 46 and where we go with this. Uh, in the legislature, I voted against Act 46 because although I'm very sympathetic to the drivers of the problem, we, you know, the de demographics don't lie. We have a decreasing number of students, uh, about 86,000 now as opposed to 107,000 20 years ago. Uh, we have 281 school districts to serve those children, and we have the lowest student-staff ratio in the country. So we have an expensive system, but I don't believe that the answers are necessarily contained within Act 46. And I would say that events in these towns have borne me out on that. Uh, that said, we do have a very good school system. Uh, various organizations have ranked it between second and fifth in the country in terms of outcomes, including ALEC, which is not what I would usually quote for my resources. But uh, they've actually ranked Vermont school outcomes number one in the country. Um, as far as changes to it go, it, it's the law of the land, so we need to work with it. Um, I attempted to, mod to amend it uh, during the last term, and I will continue to do so with specific changes, like uh, 
lengthening the timelines, uh, belonging to more than one study uh, group at a time, and, uh, and having lower number of target numbers of students. These are specific changes that we can adapt to, uh, hopefully pass, as opposed to um, rescinding it, which I don't think will happen. There are a lot of schools and districts who are already invested in it. They've uh, invested time, money, and their communities' emotional energy into uh, making it work for their communities. Thank you. Mr. Rosenthal, you have two minutes on Act 46 in your position. Well, first of all, um, I think it takes more to uh, more than just saying I vote against it. I believe that this is a uh, significant piece of legislation that was passed last session. I uh, I believe that uh, it takes someone to ask the hard questions, and if the legislature can't answer the, the uh, governance questions, then I believe they should not have passed this piece of legislation out. I believe they should have drafted. It. Uh, put it in a draft form and take it around to the school boards and take it around to the communities for input. Then go back to the then go back <coughs> this year and, and fix it. That's not the case. So so here we have Act 46. The question was about uh, your respective positions uh, relative to Act 46 school mergers. Well, the, f the school mergers uh, would not be addressed until I believe there's a moratorium for the first four years. The governance questions and the uh, administrative questions are, are dealt right now, uh, that, that the school boards are dealing with right now, and the communities are dealing with right now. Um, I believe that, uh, again, I, I believe that this is such a difficult piece of legislation that watching uh, uh, PEG TV and watching the uh, school board, the state, uh, the state board of education, struggle with the issues uh, that communities present them um, I believe that the, uh, the, the uh, State Board of Education should, should be required to attend these, uh, these uh, sco uh, school board discussions. I also believe that the uh, timeline should be extended a year. As uh, Robin said, though, a uh, majority of the towns in the urban areas have already approved these, and uh, there'll be a big struggle to, to, uh, to extend the deadline. Um, Let's see, the other, uh, the other issue is the uh, geographical area. I believe that uh, uh, the, the large towns have already merged, the, the smaller rural towns are still struggling. And I believe that they should lower the number of students from 900, you know, to something manageable. Thank you. Thank you. So under the format of the debate, Mr. Cessna Tangerman, if you wish to rebut, you could have a minute rebuttal or we can move on to the next question. In which case, Mr. Rosenthal would prefer. Let's move on. Okay, Mr. Rosenthal, um, two choices that are facing our community at this point in regards to Act 46, uh, in addition to the consolidation of the school boards, is school choice versus the interstate agreement or designation that we currently have with New York State for three of the communities in this representative districts, the other communities have uh, uh, school choice. So if you could set forth your position on school choice versus designation, we would appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, talk, well, the first question, this is, well, excuse me, second question, will you support school choice for competitive and quality education? Well, that kind of implies that uh, the schools that the, uh, the uh, public schools that uh, people are attending are, are, are not, are, do not provide quality education or are not competitive. And I believe that they are. Um, I do believe that, uh, that uh, designation is obviously the most uh, inexpensive. However, I believe that this, legis this upcoming legislative session needs to deal with uh, school choice. Um, it, it had been in effect prior to Act 46. I believe that they should revisit that. Um, uh, the next question was, it's a two-part question, will you support interstate agreements in this? Uh, those uh, interstate agreements are with Rupert, uh, Rupert being with Salem and uh, uh, Grant, uh, excuse me, Wells being with Granville. Um, I believe, again, that's part of school choice. I mean, so, um, 
In any event, I believe that the legislature should take the time and effort to uh, address this. Mr. Chestnut Tangerman. As Vermonters, we, most of us wear many hats. One of the hats I wear is that I'm a licensed teacher, a high school social studies teacher. Uh, as an educator, I know that children learn, in different, learn best in different environments. As an individual and as a teacher, I'm supportive of school choice because I believe that children need different environments to meet their different needs, different learning styles. That said, as a legislator, I believe my job is to enable whatever it is that the communities decide. I'm not a resident of Pollock Wells or Rupert, so I'm not advocating for choice or designation in those communities. In Middletown Springs, where I'm a resident, I will speak my mind as a resident. Uh, but uh, in Rupert, Pollock, and Wells, um, my job, as I see it, is to enable the communities to move forward with the choices that they make in free and open debate. Uh, and the distinction between uh, interstate compacts and choice, I, I actually don't see that as a distinction. Choice would include attending schools in New York State. Uh, so I don't see those as exclusive in that regard. Thank you. Do you wish to take an opportunity to rebut? <coughs> okay. Um, just for clarification, um, Mr. Rosenthal has mentioned questions. Um, we were given questions by members of the select board and uh, other government officials um, ahead of time. And those questions came in unedited um, in an attempt to ask the questions in a neutral manner. I may not be asking them verbatim. So uh, my apologies to the two candidates. I'm not going to simply read the questions. I'm going to cover the, the subject matter, but attempt to ask the question in a manner that doesn't lead to one result or the other. Um, the next issue that we're going to address is a regional police force. Um, and whether it would be prudent to, as a legislature, legislator, to develop or implement a regional police force for the small rural communities that they serve, the legislators serve. Is that a good idea for us? Not a good idea for us, um, if you would care to address. Um, Mr. Chestnut Tangerman, the lead on this question. As I go around and talk with constituents, knock on doors, I do hear of an unmet need for law enforcement, people who are frustrated by slow response times of the state troopers in particular, who are uh, often understaffed for the areas that they have to cover. Um, the idea of a regional police force is not something I had considered before, a regional law enforcement. And in general, I'm opposed to the cost of duplicating and maintaining bureaucracies that already exist. We have state troopers, we have Rutland County sheriffs, and many towns have constables. So we have three forms of law enforcement already. I'd be much more interested in sitting down, seeing where the gaps exist, why the service that, that residents need are not being provided, and how to address those rather than creating a new organization, a new entity, and the costs that go along with that. Mr. Rosenthal? I have a lot, I have extensive experience in this, uh, particularly this question. We, Town of Pulteney, participated in a, uh, a discussion with the towns of Fairhaven and uh, uh, Castleton to, to uh, look at uh, creating a regional class police force. Uh, the state police have made it clear that they do not uh, want to be the local uh, police uh, for, the, for municipalities. And as far as being a dupl uh, duplicate, uh, the const excuse me, the uh, state police sometimes have, may have one person on duty on, on the uh, west side of Rutland County. Um, I wouldn't, and they also share services with the, the local police departments in Fairhaven and Castleton. So when someone gets a call, they all mutually, depending on the, on the call, they all attend, uh, particularly if it's a, uh, uh, a, uh, a robbery in progress or a physical abuse or, or what have you. 
So it, it's not a duplication of services. There's huge gaps in services. Um, uh, the Vermont League of Cities and Towns have policy, excuse me, yes, policies, and uh, contracts uh, that they've generated to assist on the municipalities. They're worth looking at the towns of Pulteney, like I said, the towns of Pulteney, Fairhaven, and Castleton did look at that. Uh, the, the problems were that, uh, you know, who's going to pay the most and who's going who's to get the most coverage, and, and that's why that particular thing failed. But it's, it's certainly not a duplication of service. Thank you. Do you want to move on? Um, in the last session of the legislature, the legislature passed um, a, a bill authorizing regional planning commissions to, uh, if, if contracted by the communities, to provide services, administrative services, that small towns have trouble meeting themselves because uh, small towns don't necessarily have the resources or the personnel or the technical uh, expertise to meet many of the demands of modern culture. And uh, I think that there is an opportunity for regional governance, regional uh, uh, cooperation in, in something like this, uh, perhaps using the model of the, uh, of the regional, of the planning commissions. Thank you. Uh, the next issue uh, is an issue that faces, uh, or has been faced in Rumlin County quite a bit. Um, sorry, Rupert, Bennington County, but um, is the siting and development of commercial scale wind, solar, energy projects. So we'd be interested in hearing what your position is or would be as a legislator on allowing municipalities more or less input or uh, how you would recommend that the legislature addresses citing uh, development of commercial scale wind and solar energy projects. And um, if you think it's important, uh, we can break it out and you can certainly request to be another two minutes uh, to address the second half of that question, which is how would you continue to promote alternate energy sources, um, keeping in mind our Vermont landscape, including uh, in addition to wind and solar, hydroelectric. So if you'd want two separate ones, I'm happy to do that. Uh, but the first is restricting uh, the, or regulating the siting and development of commercial scale projects. Um, Mr. Rosenthal, you have the lead on this one. I am not hearing you as clearly as, so please hold that a little bit closer to you. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. <coughs> Well, first of all, there was a recent uh, bill in the legislature that uh, would uh, give the Public Service Board until November 1st to develop some uh, siting criteria of which if the municipalities want any say in the siting of these, is it too loud? No, no, no. That, they would, uh, that they would have to uh, uh, generate uh, siting criteria. Uh, to give a, uh, uh, to have some deference in a public service board hearing. Now, uh, the town of Pulteney develop, and, and each town can, can develop in their own town plans, and the energy section uh, that addresses uh, uh, renewable energy. Uh, that's one of the criteria uh, under the Vermont Planning and Development Land Use uh, laws. Now, the town of Pulteney had developed a specific criteria, I forgot, it's, it's in whatever section. In any event, they did, did uh, discuss uh, that they support small-scale development and of uh, solar and uh, solar and uh, wind. However, um, these are generally large commercial operations in rural residential districts. So obviously there's a lot of opposition, and, um, uh, and, and, and the town should uh, uh, begin to, de to make a voice and, and develop uh, its, uh, its plan in the, in the regular town plan. Having said that, after the town plan was adopted, uh, the town of Pulteney's uh, developed siting criteria for both solar and um, 
solar and wind. Now, and we came to find out that uh, that the Public Service Board has has uh, Public Service Board has uh, full control, so the municipalities do not have uh, any any say. So I would uh, take it uh, come to bond your own municipality, your own planning commission, your own select board to develop a uh, energy uh, plan. Thank you, Mr. Chisholm. Energy siting and uh, go ahead with the door. Why don't we roll up while we shut the doors so we can hear. So the question at hand was the uh, siting uh, and development of commercial wind and solar energy projects. Go ahead. So this is a subject that's actually worthy of a whole lot of two minute sections. Uh, but I think we're limited to two of those tonight. This is something that my committee worked on extensively last year. And I'd just like to paint a before and after picture. In terms of renewable energy siting, the previous standard was the towns received due consideration on siting. Due consideration means that the Public Service Board in granting approval basically says, yes, we read your town plan. End of story. We passed a bill which lays out a plan for towns to participate in a planning and siting process from the start and with the help of regional planning commissions because it is a technical process. And most towns don't have that technical ability, but uh, regional planning commissions can help with that. At the end of this process, towns receive substantial deference, which is the highest standard short of veto power. And so we have laid out a plan by which towns can have substantial say substantial, legally substantial deference in terms of citing energy projects, renewable or conventional energy projects. So people spoke, the legislature heard and responded appropriately, I believe. Thank you. Do you want an opportunity to rebut? Yes. Uh, they Thank won't you. have to, uh, deference until the Public Service Board writes its rules uh, effective November 1st. So then we'll look at that and take a look at those um, comments, rules, what have you, and then the towns can develop their own set of uh, policies and criteria. But uh, they have no deference in these uh, public service board hearings as we stand right now. And if I'm wrong, uh, then I've read the information incorrectly, but I believe that it's November 1st. Do you want to cover about one minute? The, the pathway is laid out and exists, and um, I, to be honest, I forget whether it goes into effect November 1st, but there is a pathway to move forward on this issue. Um, citing, we have also, uh, both the legislature and the Public Service Board, responded to a number of other citing concerns, particularly use of prime farmland for solar arrays, by uh, changing the, the uh, incentivization to, uh, to apply to reward building on built landscapes, on gravel pits, quarries, parking lots, rooftops, um, places that have already been disturbed and not on, on virgin farmland or, or uh, prime farmland. Um, so uh, there are a number of ways that communities can have input on siting these uh, inappropriate places. Thank you. In part because I did receive a request Late in the process, I'm going to ask the second part of this question as a separate question. And um, so, if elected, um, would you continue to promote alternate energy sources such as wind and solar and uh, hydroelectric? Um, and how would you uh, incorporate that into our Vermont landscape, which seems to be the heart of the question? How do we promote these if it's if it's prudent to promote them, how do we promote them while protecting our landscape? So, Mr. Chestnut Tangerman, I'll give you two minutes, and then Mr. Rosenthal, two minutes as well. Uh, 
the answer is absolutely yes, I would, and will continue to promote renewable energy, um, not just in terms of the, the carbon footprint and the environmental impacts, but it's also a huge boost to the economy. Uh, there are 17,700 jobs in Vermont right now in the clean energy industry. That is a huge motivator and uh, provides a lot of income for a lot of people. Um, not only that, it's a net gain to the state through the uh, REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. The state receives millions of dollars in payments every year from other New England states because of the efficiencies that we have made in terms of our generation and usage. Uh, efficiency Vermont is a model for much of the rest of the country. We have an efficiency utility whose job is to conserve energy. These things combine to give Vermonters 40% lower than average electric bills. Nationally, our bills are 40% lower than the national average. That's despite relatively high electric rates, but because of the efficiencies, we actually pay less out of pocket. I think that renewable energy is an important part of our economy, an important part of maintaining the, the, uh, the beauty of Vermont. Mr. Rosenthal. Uh, yes, it is important to the economy. However, the question says, if elected, how would you continue to promote alternative energy sources without ruining our Vermont landscape? Now, there's an oxymoron. Um, the town of Colney and Ira had uh, 40 windmills, 400 feet in height, and I forgot the, the length of the, uh, the blade. You talk about some angry people that had no input whatsoever in, in the, uh, in the uh, public service board's uh, discussions. And eventually, uh, the people from these regions created enough um, noise that the, I guess the financial backers backed out. So again, you know, how would you create 40, 400 foot windmills and, and save without ruining the Vermont landscape. I mean, if somebody has an idea, please let me know. Um, the, other, uh, the other concern is you have to strip these mountainside or whatever they're all, hills, uh, and, and create a lot of uh, erosion uh, to uh, just to get up there. And um, you know, we're all about clean water and, and cleaning up the environment. Uh, that would create some uh, awful, uh, uh, what do you call that, a uh, runoff, a storm runoff. Um, however, there are some areas for the uh, solar um, areas in, uh, with proper siting, you know, uh, proper screening uh, that, that could be, uh, 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 that we could use. Uh, but uh, those, we really need to, consider creating that criteria before you accept, uh, before you uh, allow these uh, large solar farms. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rebut. Thank you. So over the last decade, the purpose of uh, the Vermont legislature has been to essentially jumpstart the clean energy economy in Vermont. Uh, we've had great success with that. Uh, in terms of per, per, per capita clean energy production and usage, um, we've, we have succeeded in that. And that's why the legislature this year, this, this past session, has um, slowed down the process, refined it, and uh, done the, the work on, on siting that I mentioned before, on uh, building on, on built landscapes already instead of uh, pristine areas. Um, and whether Windmills are uh, a blight. Many people see them that way. Many people see them as something that's beautiful and, and a little bit mesmerizing. And, uh, and that is a, a personal opinion, and, and opinions vary widely on that. Thank you. Mr. Rosenthal, do you want a minute to address this question further? Sure. I, I haven't spoken to anybody that believes that windmills are uh, I mean, I don't know how this community would feel if you had 
40 windmills along this ridge line, I, I don't think anybody would be happy. Uh, I'd like to show, ask for a show of hands, but I don't think that's proper. <laughs> Thank you. So anyway, um, I think, uh, again, this is, you know, if you read the question, without ruining our Vermont landscape, again, that's an oxymoron. Just, you know, I, I just, I don't see them in Timoth, I don't see them in uh, Ira, I don't see them in uh, Pulteney, I don't see them in Wells. Um, anyway, thank you. Thank you. On to the next question. Uh, concerning recycling and waste stream, what type of state legislation would you propose to help smaller communities address the infrastructure requirements necessary for the coming recycling and waste stream requirements? And Mr. Chestnut Tangerman, you're first on this question. This is also not a theoretical question for me, but relates to uh, the work that I've been doing in the legislature for the last two years. Um, I sit on the Natural Resources and Energy Committee there, and one of the issues that we deal with is solid waste. Now, the, the solid waste districts, which are responsible for implementing uh, solid waste laws in the, in the state, uh, are funded through a, a fee on solid waste. That hasn't changed since 1989, while the demands of, uh, for recycling, for composting, and for solid waste handling have increased dramatically. Uh, in, the, in the legislature, I took the lead on trying to raise more money for solid waste districts and private haulers to meet the requirements of, of Act 40, particularly in the uh, organics collection and disposal. Uh, for a number of reasons, that bill did not succeed. Um, I look forward to new ideas and fresh approaches. Um, but one of the reasons is driving it. Act 48, Act 148, the solid waste uh, bill, is that disposing of solid waste is expensive. We have one commercial landfill in the state up in Coventry. At current rates, that landfill will be full in seven years. You want to talk about solid waste costs spiking after that? It won't be. It won't be pretty. So the more that we can do to extend the life of that landfill, the better. And that includes diverting. I believe it's 27% of our waste stream is organics. That, that would extend the life several years automatically right there. Uh, recycling makes sense in terms of resources, in terms of economics, in terms of waste. Um, there are challenges, and, uh, and I'm working on getting funding for communities and haulers to meet those challenges. Mr. Rosenthal. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's not just solid waste districts that uh, that are responsible for implementing the rules of uh, Act 1, uh, 148. Um, I've been a town manager for 31 years, and we have to we have to abide by the rules uh, uh, generated by the Agency of Natural Resources on Solid Waste. And uh, yes, the towns of all the towns belong to either a solid waste district or a, what they call a SWIP or a swap or whatever. Um, in any event, having said that, um, I look at the systems analysis of the impact of Act 148 solid waste management. We, we talk about uh, the um, uh, uh, organic waste. Uh, there's currently a shortfall cited in this report of about $20 million of uh, infrastructure support needed to handle this solid waste, uh, this waste. And let me tell you right now, as the health officer of the town of Pulteney, I have folks that are trying to compost on lots of 65 by 100 on solid waste. And, and I can tell you it's not pretty. Um, but as I said, uh, we're talking about a $20 million shortfall uh, that the legislature is looking at and the state's looking at. Um, on another matter, so uh, a lot of these haulers, you know, the large haulers, are looking to have to develop the the, uh, uh, the infrastructure to support the, uh, the elimination of waste. There's a lot of small haulers that are going to be affected that don't have the resources, you know, to to collect this waste. Uh, the um, I think Robin said that the tax hasn't been raised since 1988. Uh, there's a tax on your solid waste you probably aren't aware of, and that's uh, six dollars a ton. It's been there for a while. Uh, the legislature, for the past two years, has been trying to raise it to twelve dollars a ton. 
Um, if there is additional, uh, if the uh, if there's additional uh, costs associated with it, you'll see. Well, actually, the town of Rupert. I'm speaking to the town of Rupert. They closed their transfer station. They're not looking at these rules anymore. They're they're asking the, the private citizen to to find a local contractor to pick up your garbage. Okay. So can you wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you. Do you wish to rebut? Yes. Uh, so the final proposal that, that we were working on in committee was uh, was increasing that that six dollar fee to a nine dollar a ton fee, which would have come up with funding for that short haul. That funding would have been used in the form of startup grants for solid waste districts and for private haulers, especially smaller private haulers, to meet those needs. Exactly the ones that Jonas is talking about. Uh, those are those are real needs, and uh, and. Uh, and it's a proposal, you know, we need to, to enable our communities to deal with these requirements, which is something that I have been working on. Um, oh, and just for, for reference, that uh, increase to $9 a ton would have meant that uh, Vermont, Vermonters paid under $2 a year more to dispose of solid waste. That would have been the, the impact of it on, on our pocketbooks. You wish to uh, rebut? Sure. Uh, the agency proposed a $12, uh, uh, 12 excuse me, a $6 increase to up to $12. That would have generated an additional $2.2 million to um, uh, offset the needed infrastructure of $20 million. So I don't know where they're going to get the rest. I don't know what the, the, the committee had uh, proposed, maybe it was $9, but the Agency of Natural Resources for the last two years proposed in, doubling that tax. Uh, there also, um, if it was a $2 increase, I read the report, I think they're looking at uh, roughly a $6 a month, a $6 increase per month on solid waste uh, charges. So I don't know where, uh, and, and this again, this is from this uh, a and report. I didn't, I'm not making this up. Uh, there are tremendous challenges. I'm not against recycling. Uh, there's another, uh, another uh, challenge as more people recycle. Uh, the state is being, getting less of the $6 a ton, and they're looking at, uh, uh, in the next two or three years, of running a deficit in that account, or in that uh, fund. Time, thank you. Um, the next issue is, uh, again, I'm not going to read the question verbatim, um, but as a state representative, do you believe in more or less local control on those issues that affect towns, schools, farms, and businesses, such things as solar siting, ag practices, et cetera? Um, and Mr. Rosenthal, do you have the lead on this question? Well, first of all, being a town manager of a small town, 3,400, um, I can tell you that, the, that I am faced with every day of providing clean water, uh, a clean wastewater discharge, proper method, proper uh, uh, siting for getting rid of your solid waste, uh, doing water source protection plans for our wells uh, every three years. Um, and actually living and, and, and doing the things that the legislature requires us to do. I'm not complaining about it, but I'm thinking that I think we need to slow down a little bit. You know, uh, the towns do have, uh, first of all, the towns do not have uh, 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 home rule. So the town doesn't, can't make up its own regulations. The towns have to follow the regulations that the, that the legislature sets, and they give the rulemaking authority to agency of natural resources, the Department of Agriculture, and so on. So the municipalities have to figure this out, and this is what I do uh, 365 days a year for 31 years. I don't make this stuff up. I, I, I actually live it, breathe it, and eat it. So um, in any event, towns have the authority to develop ordinances on a variety of things, and solid waste is one of them. And I, I don't remember, it's under Title 24, but uh, 
towns do have the authority to develop their own ordinances. Thank you, Mr. Chestnut. Yeah. As Jonas indicated, uh, the state operates under something called Dillon's Rule, which says that the state has the authority unless that authority is specifically designated to communities. Within that, we strive to find the correct balance, a workable balance between local and state control. Um, the question was originally phrased, government interference. Um, I much prefer John's reading of it, about uh, the appropriate balance. Um, and there are a lot of places where state controls are common sense. For example, you know, gun laws, you don't want different communities having different gun laws so that you unwittingly become a felon when you cross from Holtley into Wells or the other way around. The state has a legal ob obligation to maintain, to, to provide equal opportunity to, of education to all children. That is the state obligation. This, therefore, the state has to, to meet its own obligations, has to enforce that towns do that. Towns then do not have the option to say, well, you know, we don't need computers in our school because it's too expensive. So there are a lot of areas where the state control, state, I don't mean control, but oversight um, or state regulation is, uh, is important in ensuring equal opportunity, equal access, um, and equal protection to the communities in the state. Uh, you know, Middletown Springs, we shouldn't really care what we pump into the Poultney River because we've got good water. But Poultney should care a great deal what we put into the water. That shouldn't be a town decision. That should be a state issue about the quality of our water so that we all have the same opportunity. Thank you. Do you wish to rebut? Okay, let's go on to the next question. The next question is one I personally had difficulty with. So I'm just going to um, talk only because it talks about science. And I'm an attorney for a reason. <laughs> so, um, so I'm just going to touch on, it's a, regarding carbon tax. And climate change has been a hot topic, if you'll pardon the pun. Um, and so I'm just going to ask each of them what their thoughts are on a carbon tax. Is it an appropriate thing, not an appropriate thing, rather than getting into the uh, detailed minutia of the particular question. And uh, Mr. Chestnut Tangerman, it's your lead on this question. A carbon pollution tax is one mechanism uh, of trying to deal with climate change. Uh, climate change is a very real problem that we are experiencing right now. Each of the last 15 months has been hotter than the previous year, than it was the previous year. Climate change is real, and it's not just warming temperatures, it's, it's weather. It's severe storms, severe droughts, winds. Uh, the intensity of weather is changing, not just here, but around the world. And... Uh, According to some scientists, the threshold that we needed to stay below was 350 parts per million. We've just passed 400 parts per million. The carbon pollution tax is a proposal to tax carbon fuels to essentially force the transition away from carbon fuels into cleaner alternatives. It's not a money grab. It's not that the state keeps the money. The money is redistributed to reduce the impact on lower and middle income people who would be hardest hit by it. That said, it's problematic for me. We don't live in a vacuum. We live in a small state with a lot of long borders of other states who would not necessarily implement the carbon tax. And when our gas is more expensive than New Hampshire's gas, guess where people are going to buy their gas? So, um, to me, it's not a straightforward yes or no. Um, I think it bears a lot of looking into. My own preference is a regional plan. So all of New England is working together, similar to uh, the REGI program, which is the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Um, I think there are opportunities to act regionally. Um, 
to, to protect the environment and uh, work toward a clean energy future. Mr. Rosenthal. Yes, if, if, John, if you don't mind, if I could just read the first sentence, or the first question. Sure, two minutes. Okay. It says, what is the advantage of taxing the public uh, upwards of 9, 89 cents a gallon on heating oil, uh, heating oil, gas, and propane? And I believe you left out the 89 cents, and I believe you left out the question, or the answer to the 89 cents. Um, but I guess you answered it based on what John asked. Um, 89 cents is a lot of money and uh, per gallon. So if you are spending 700, uh, uh, if you buy, purchase 700 gallons of uh, propane or fuel oil or what have you, just add an another 89, round it off at 90 cents. So I don't know what the up the upwards of collecting maybe $500 million, what we're looking to do with, with that amount of money, uh, but I can see a severe impact on the economy of uh, the state of Vermont if we implement a carbon tax of 89 cents a gallon. I mean, that was the question, I believe, it was brought up in the legislature, maybe not last year, but the year before. So in any event, I think it would, uh, what is the advantage? I, I don't know. I'm certainly for home home improvements, uh, energy improvements, and so on. But I, I, I just there's no way I can support an energy tax of 89, 89 cents a gallon. Thank you. And before we allow for rebuttal, I just want to say that um, I phrased the question because I don't want to get in the position where we're addressing particular answers to a problem. So if somebody would say 79 cents is okay, 89 cents is not okay, um, I'd rather have information on your position in regards to whether or not a carbon tax is appropriate or not, and at what level you may think it's appropriate. It's entirely up to you to address the, the issue. But I'm not trying to avoid the question. I'm just trying to ask a general question so we can get as much information from you as appropriate. That, with that being said, uh, Mr. Chestnut Tangerine, you have a minute of rebuttal if you choose. There were uh, at least two proposals in the legislature last year, or the year before, uh, differing in details, which is one reason why I didn't address details, because in the new year there are, right now there are no proposals. We start with a clean slate every session. So uh, who knows what proposals will be put forward in the, in the coming session. Um, that said, there was, the legislature commissioned a study, I believe it was by Rand Corporation, um, on the effects of a carbon pollution tax. Um, it was an in-depth study, and their conclusion overall was that the, car the carbon tax that they studied would actually provide a slight economic boost to the state of Vermont, depending on how the money is redistributed and how incentives um, are handled. It's a, it's a complex and difficult question. There's no doubt about that. It's not a not a, a quick yes or no. Um, but there was an in-depth study showing that it would be a small boost to the economy of the state. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Would you care for a minute of rebuttal? I'd love to see that report. Uh, <laughs> um, just I just can't believe that. A large tax, carbon tax, forget whatever number you want, uh, would be an economic benefit. Do I believe in climate change? Oh, yes, absolutely. I don't know what the benefit is of uh, uh, taxing, putting an additional tax on the backs of hardworking Vermonters, and, and they're going to somehow change their driving patterns to work, or heating their house, or uh, doing other things. I think it has a, it, again, I didn't do the study. I just can't believe that that would be an economic boost for the community, for the state of Vermont. Thank you. The next question. Uh, Vermont is one of eight states that still taxes Social Security for seniors. Is it time for a change? Why or why not? Uh, you have the first opportunity on this, Mr. Rosenthal. 
let me let me jump to the, the last two budgets that were approved by the legislature. Uh, the last two budgets um, had deficits. The FY16 uh, had a uh, budget had a deficit of close to eighty million dollars. So the legislature raised fees and uh, taxes. Uh, well, actually, let me back up here. The general government, uh, the general fund portion of the of the entire budget uh, was uh, something like one over a million. Uh, excuse me, one point some odd billion. Um, the revenues generate. Excuse me. The, the increase in the general government budget portion of the of the entire budget increased 4.8 percent. The revenues only coming into the state was projected at 2.2 million. That's why we had a deficit going into FY, FY17. And that's, that's why they raised the fees of over $100 million to meet that deficit. So again, they raised, I think, again, it's the, the general government, the general government uh, portion of the entire budget. It's like a $5.8 billion budget and the uh, this, the state portion is under two million, and again, the, I think it was four point eight percent increase in the general government portion, and uh, again, the, the revenues coming into the general government portion were under two point four, two point five percent. That's why we have the deficits. However, if we were able to save one penny on on one dollar. Um, if for one penny on one dollar, we would save 50, 55 million dollars on a, on a 5.8 million, uh, 5 .8 million dollar, uh, budget. I would love to take these funds and reduce Social Security taxes for seniors. Um, I certainly, there were other, th uh, other things would have to occur as well. So it's, it's a start. Thank you. Mr. Chestnut Tanger. I believe that the question was, do you support eliminating the tax on Social Security benefits for Vermont seniors? The answer is yes. <laughs> that was quick. Mr. Rosenthal, can, you can I take another 15 seconds? Or sure. <laughs> <laughs> I actually did approach the uh, Ways and Means Committee about this. Uh, I can start to sit down again. Um, so I did uh, uh, ask Ways and Means Committee about this, who uh, raise revenues for the state of Vermont, and uh, asking why why we do this. We were one of um, the, the counts vary, but uh, not a lot of states tax pensions and social security benefits. Um, we do. They said if you can find another revenue source, we'd be happy not to do that. So that's my goal. Um, it's. Uh, what I look forward to doing in the coming session. Yes? Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, Mr. Rosenthal, would you care to rebut? Sure. Having, having worked in the budget office as a budget analyst in the state of Montana, there are many different revenue sources. And understanding the, the complexity of an entire state budget, there's many different sources of revenue. Um, would love to see, as as Robin said, you would love to eliminate the, the social security taxes. You would obviously have to find another source of revenue to make up the difference. What I'm saying, what I'm suggesting, is that if you took one penny of one dollar and were able to find some savings of some inefficiencies or some other method, uh, you would you could save a, a, approximately five five billion. Excuse me. Uh, Fifty-five million dollars, and that would go. Up, that would be a start to eliminating uh, taxes on Social Security for seniors. Thank you, Mr. Chestnut. Tangerman, do you wish to take a minute to rebut? Yes. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the next question, um, and again, I, this question, I'm. Paraphrasing, but I'm going to ask each of you to explain your position on, and partly because I'm paraphrasing, is because I think it left out some of the choices. 
uh, in, the, in the way the question was asked. But please explain your position on single payer health care versus a health care exchange versus open market health care. Uh, Mr. Chestnut Tangerman, you have the lead on this question. Uh, the question about single payer health care uh, versus Health Connect versus open market, uh, we don't have single payer, so that's not something that, that we can uh, leave uh, or give up. Uh, unfortunately, we do have Vermont Health Connect, uh, which has been a huge problem um, for everybody, you know including my family. We've had endless headaches with it. Uh, the question of whether we can move to the federal exchange is not quite that simple. The federal exchange doesn't do everything that Vermont Health Connect does, so we would need to establish a parallel system to handle Dr. Dinosaur and Medicaid. Um, so it's not just a, a quick replacement. And, uh, and the legislature did uh, commission a study report is due in December looking at alternatives. Are there state plans that we can model ours after, that we can piggyback onto? Something to get this working after all. Um, we have put vast quantities of money into it, much of it federal money, some of it state money, um, but even more in terms of uh, credibility and uh, patience and, and goodwill. <coughs> Uh, we need to get that fixed one way or the other. Um, the, uh, one of the, the options, uh, well, we're also, one of the, the things that the state is looking at is uh, the possibility of study of, of single-payer primary care. The goal, if we can get everybody access to primary care, we reduce more expensive and more severe illnesses later on, cutting medical costs. There are lots of other uh, approaches to, to medical savings, uh, which hopefully we will get back to. Thank you. Mr. Rosenthal? Uh, yes. Um, first of all, there is, uh, there, there used to be three major uh, insurance plans. Aetna is out of the question, I believe. Aetna does not offer uh, plans. Uh, that I'm aware of, but it's uh, MVP and Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, you have that choice through uh, Vermont Health Connect. But let me just say, when Robin said, well, it was 200, oh, I don't think he said 200 million. He didn't say. But it was over 200 million dollars, and he said, well, some of that was the federal share. I don't, know, I don't know how much the state share was, but it's 200 million dollars of your tax money. And uh, the, the uh, legislature did uh, uh, create a study committee after the governor, after years, after years, after years of missing deadlines for correcting the system. And the, the legislature finally agreed to a study committee to find out if it's possible to switch to a federal exchange. How much, I don't even, how much it costs, how much we have spent in the last uh, couple of years on, on the uh, Vermont Health Connect. Um, I can tell you that uh, it's been difficult for a lot of Vermonters. Uh, you know, we had to try to enroll our employees, uh, but eventually we just gave up and went with uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. And, uh, but it's, um, we do, again, it's, uh, It'd be interesting to see what the report comes out in December uh, says, and, and uh, what uh, you know what changes we're going to make. So it's a challenge, and everybody should be concerned. Thank you. Do you want a rebuttal? I've just completely forgotten what I was going to say. <laughs> um, Uh, this, this would be collaboration, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, oh yes, so one of the, uh, um, my proposals in the legislature has been to actually dedicate one of the legislative committees to become, to change the committee structure so that one of the committees becomes an IT committee. 
we have a lot of problems in uh, information technology across the state, including outdated systems. You know, human services doesn't speak, computers don't speak to uh, healthcare computers. Um, we're trying to deal with Vermont Access as an ancillary part of the healthcare committee. I think that we need a committee dedicated to upgrading Vermont into the 21st century, <coughs> focusing on these technologies and getting the capabilities that we lack. Thank you. Mr. Rosenthal, you have a minute if you choose. Well, let me just say, uh, I have plenty of senior moments. I do forget what I, what I uh, sometimes have to say. I forget phone numbers. I forget to call people back. But, you know, after 31 years, you know, at least I'm entitled to that. However, having said that, having said that, um, the state has the state has spent over $200 million on Vermont Health Connect. And uh, I still hear some of the horror stories, horror, horror stories, of people trying to wait seven and a half hours on the phone to have their call taken. And uh, I do work with an employee in the town, the town of Pulteney who stayed home and left her phone on speaker for seven and a half hours. Wow. Yes. So, I'm not saying everybody's had that experience, but I do, I am saying that for $200 million, that, that's, that's not good. Thank you. Thank you. The next question was difficult for a number of us to try and get a handle on. I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and kind of break it out, simplify it, and I'm going to take a portion of it. It has to deal, do, deal with immigration, legal and, and illegal. And I'm going to move a portion of it into the dairy question, but for this question here, for this two minutes, um, I think part of what the, whoever asked the question was getting at is uh, as follows. How would you as a legislator address the refugee situation that is currently happening in Rutland County? And uh, I believe Mr. Rosenthal, you have the lead on this, according to my worksheet. Extremely difficult position, uh, excuse me, uh, question because I'm not familiar with all the particulars that I've been following, all the discussions that uh, Robin City has had. Um, certainly, um, information, uh, any information is important to make decisions. Um, if, you, if you don't have the proper information, and you don't have the, 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 the proper um, statistics, then you can't manage a program. Uh, that's that's uh, the same for uh, for uh, solid waste, for Act 46, and school merger. Um, it, it's, it's, if, you, if you can't manage the question, if you can't manage the numbers, if you can't manage the information, then you can't manage the program. And it does take time. It does take time to to uh, you know, come up with the, the solutions. I think in this particular situation, I think, uh, uh, I guess the mayor uh, jumped ahead without informing anybody, and, and uh, boy, you know, I don't know how to answer that question in this community or Town of Wells or any other community because I certainly don't have the information. Thank you, Mr. Chestnut Tenderman. As Jonas said, this, this is a difficult question. Um, immigration is not a, a state issue, it's a federal issue. And refugee resettlement is not a state issue, it's a city issue. There are cities which um, have offered to work with the, the federal government as resettlement cities. Um, Winooski is, is one. Um, there are many other small and mid-sized cities around the country doing the same thing. Um, that said, um, I'm going to speak in, in general terms that you know, we are a nation of immigrants, all of us. And our ancestors faced uh, often mistrust, suspicion when they came here, including my own ancestors. Um, I mean, 
German ancestors probably did not speak English when they arrived, but they were hardworking, diligent, and wanted to get ahead, essentially to live the American dream. Um, and that issue of uh, the American dream, the ideal of freedom, of upward mobility, of, of having opportunity to prove yourself, to make something of yourself, um, you know, to be rewarded for your effort and your ability to live in a meritocracy. That is the American dream. And voting on who can or cannot be part of the club is not something that we do as Americans. We give that opportunity to people to prove themselves and to become part of our fabric. Um, that said, there are a whole lot of issues about the process. Jonas addressed the issue that there's not all the information we would wish about that, which is why I addressed it in general philosophical terms rather than specifics. Thank you. Do you wish to take it up? Thank you. Um, I'm not sympathetic to uh, immigrants. Uh, my grandparents uh, came to the United States from Lithuania. Uh, they left the persecution of, the, of, uh, of uh, being Jewish. Uh, uh, they did relocate to Baltimore, and uh, they in, in, uh, did have some issues early on. Uh, but there was a strong uh, community. I don't know how they immigrated here. I, I don't know the particulars. Uh, I'm glad they, they left. Uh, you know, um, but I, I just cannot speak to immigration. I, I just, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck. I'm stuck. Because I don't know how this program works. And I think everybody wants to know. Or at least, at least they should know. Thank you. Do you want to take a minute? Okay. We'll move on to the next question. And Mr. Chestnut Tangerman, you have the lead on this question. What is your position on the Vermont legislature legalizing recreational use of marijuana? Why or why not? In February of this year, uh, Vermont Public Radio and Kaskinson Polling Institute did a statewide poll uh, on how Vermonters feel about legalizing recreational marijuana for adults, 21 and older. 55% approved, 32% uh, were opposed, and, uh, and the rest were not sure. As part of that, uh, Actually, it wasn't part of that. It was another study. 80,000 Vermonters admit to using marijuana, at least on a monthly basis, using cannabis. Um, numbers may be higher since this is people admitting something. Um, so we don't really know the true numbers. But if it is 80,000 people, that's a huge number. Proportionally, that's 200 people in Paula, uh, 85 people in Tinmouth, who um, are engaging in an activity that the federal government deems criminal. Uh, I think we need to look at our assumptions about why this is a criminal activity and, uh, and, and how we should treat it. Um, having a prohibition, well, if 80,000 Vermonters use it regularly, I would say prohibition has failed. Blanket state. Uh, and prohibition creates a black market. 100% of the marijuana in use in Vermont is black market marijuana. It's illegal to grow it, it's illegal to buy it. Unless it, you're out walking and it falls out of the sky into your hands, you've obtained it illegally. Um, black market, no safety regulations, no age limitations, no dosage limitations. No revenue for, for uh, enforcement or education. Uh, it, it's an entirely black market system. Thank you. Mr. Rosenthal. Uh, yes. Um, I think if the uh, Castleton State College did a, uh, a survey on how many speeders there were in the state, 
you would find well over 80,000 as well. Um, obviously, um, I don't believe that we should legalize marijuana. I believe that it's having worked with uh, youth, uh, having worked in the Big Brother Big Sister program in Great Falls, Montana, and uh, Bozeman, Montana, um, having worked in a state mental health institution for emotionally disturbed kids, I've seen I, I've seen the effects of other illegal drugs, and I am concerned about um, these. Um, providing another gateway to other drugs. I just think, you know, I don't think that we want to promote, you know, uh, another another uh, health problem in the state of Vermont. Uh, do I, would I want to lock somebody up for that? Absolutely not. But I certainly don't want to say, yeah, let's go ahead. If you're 21, go out and drink, you know, go out and smoke. You know, I'm certainly concerned about the mental health problem. The mental health aspect of the, uh, uh, of, of, of the legalizing of marijuana. Thank you, Mr. Chestnut. Tenjin, do you want to realize? Research has shown that legal prescription drugs and painkillers are far more of a gateway drug to illegal drugs, to harder illegal drugs than marijuana is. Uh, marijuana is largely non-addictive, um, and the social effects of it are far less destructive than alcohol. If you look at the number of domestic abuse situations that involve alcohol, it's easily 90%. The number involving marijuana use probably doesn't register. It's a different effect. It's a different drug. It has a different effect. I believe, mar I believe alcohol is, is a, has very negative effects on our society. It's legal. We need to look with an open mind at, at why marijuana is prohibited. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Do you wish to take another minute? No? Thank you. Um, we've gone through 10 of the approximately 15 questions that we have. Um, I would ask the candidates, it's 7.53. This was scheduled to get over at 8 o'clock. I'm enjoying the information that I'm getting, but do you want to cut the time to answer the remaining five questions down to a minute, or do you want to still keep the two-minute format? The audience have any preference? Two. We want more information, not less. We'll keep going with the two. Um, the next question concerns dairy farming. Um, dairy farming is an important part of our economy. Um, dairy farming and agriculture in general. Um, as a legislature, how would you support uh, agriculture and dairy farms, both large and small, uh, in our area? And I'm going to roll in the second part of that immigration question, just uh, because I think it's important. Foreign workers and immigrants, both legal and illegal, play an important role in our agricultural economy. So you may want to address some of the immigration concerns that were raised in that earlier question, but I think was really asking about the refugee situation. So Mr. Rosenthal, you have two minutes on dairy farming and our economy. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm not well versed on farming. Uh, I do know of <coughs> two programs, and I could be wrong, uh, two programs that call share programs uh, sponsored by the Vermont Department of Agriculture. One is the Best Management Program that deals with water quality issues. Uh, the other, uh, and I believe the, those programs are capped at $75,000 uh, per, per applicant. I don't know what the total amount of money available is, but the other is uh, the, far, the, agronics, the Farm Agronics Program, uh, what they call F FAP. Um, I guess the the uh, the amount that, that that's capped is five thousand dollars. I don't know uh, what exactly that program does. Um, but as I was told by somebody from the uh, told me Medway Natural Resource Con Conservation District, uh, that usually uh, that always runs out of money. Uh, I know that federal subsidies through the Farm Bill, it's passed every five years uh, by Congress. And 
I'm not sure what the impact is. I'm sure it's huge. It's huge impact on Vermont farms. But in any event, I, I don't have a lot of knowledge in this area. Mr. Chestnut, can Farm vitality and viability is something that I have worked on extensively in the legislature. Um, I grew up on a farm in western New York. It was tough work then. It's even harder now. Um, the, uh, the clean water related grants that Jonas mentioned yesterday, is, mentioned, which were announced yesterday, is an $800,000 pool of money to help farms comply with uh, clean water regulations. But uh, I mean, grant money alone won't do it. There are, there are a number of questions in this um, and, and different topics, but in the State House, um, I work on trying to increase viability for farms, particularly small farms, by simple things like lifting the limits, raising the limits on, uh, on farm slaughter and processing of poultry and, and another bill of uh, beef and, and pork, by uh, easing the restrictions on raw milk sales, giving farms the opportunity to sell products at retail dollars, putting more money in their pockets and making the farm more viable, more productive. Um, as far as conventional dairy goes, we are locked. If uh, we're locked in a, in a national pricing structure that forces us to go head to head with the you know three thousand or five thousand cow dairies in Wisconsin and California, Vermont farms just can't do that. We cannot compete head to head with those kinds of operations. I think we need to completely, radically rethink how we operate, raise and market dairy products in Vermont. We have a really valuable brand in the Vermont name. We do it with maple syrup, we do it with a lot of other goods, we even do it with darn tough socks. We can do it with milk, we do it with cheese already. I think there is a huge opportunity. There are 20 million people within you know, 200 miles of us. We need to look at what our redefined local market and capitalize on what we have, which is the value of the Vermont brand. Thank you. Do you wish to have a minute of rebuttal, Mr. Rosenthal? Mr. Well, there's no rebuttal, so we'll move on to the next question. Um, firearm rights in uh, the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, Article 16 of the Vermont Constitution, guarantees a citizen's right to keep and bear arms. Um, <coughs> do you believe that uh, Vermont's gun laws are too big, too small, or just right? And if so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Chestnut Tangerman, it's your opinion on this question. Call me Goldilocks for this? <laughs> um, two years ago, I was in this same building <laughs> when there were similar questions asked. Um, and my answers are essentially the same as they were then. I support expanded background checks. I think that is how you give law enforcement the tools to do their job. That's the same thing that I said two years ago. I think that uh, right now we have a, a system where if you want to buy a gun from a, sh a shop, you need to go through a background check. That's fine. If you want to avoid the background check, well, you buy one online. We don't allow that with anything else. If you buy a car from... Please keep comments down. This is time for the candidates to speak. Thank you. You can buy from an individual online without a background check. You can buy from a non-dealer at a gun show without a background check. I think we extend the same securities to gun purchases. Um, that said, there need to be some exceptions, like you know, you can give a gift to someone. You can uh, you know buy your son a shotgun. You can inherit guns. You know, reasonable exceptions like that. But across the board, in general terms, um, I do support uh, expanded background checks as a means of keeping guns out of the hands of those who shouldn't have them. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Yes, I believe that, I believe in the Second, second Amendment, I believe that uh, the current laws that we have in place uh, are effective. Uh, I believe that we need to to uh, concentrate on mental health issues and opiate addiction. Um, I'm certainly concerned about uh, uh, guns falling in the hands of, of uh, 
those individuals. Um, but I do, I, I do support the existing laws on background checks, or, or the existing gun laws that we have in place. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Tangerman, Chestnut Tangerman, excuse me, do you want a minute to rebut? Or are you? No. Okay. Um, the next two questions are in our script are issues that we've kind of already covered, so I'm going to not <coughs> move them out of order and get to an issue that we haven't covered yet, um, which concerns livestock liability. A recent case in Rumble County concern, uh, concerns criminal charges being brought against an owner of livestock. As a state legislature, should the laws be amended to prevent such changes, charges from being brought against the owner of livestock? And Mr. Rosenthal, you have the lead on this one. That wasn't in the final package that we got today, but it was in the earlier version. Um, here's the question from the earlier version. It got omitted. I don't believe in bringing criminal charges uh, to uh, against farmers whose livestock is called physical damage uh, to life or property of others. Um, certainly animals, I'm the animal control officer of the town. <coughs> Not by, not by choice, but in any event, <laughs> nobody else wants the job. It's, it's not a pretty, pretty situation. Yeah. Having said that, I have dealt with cattle in the road. I have dealt with horses in the road. Uh, and uh, when I get a call, I respond by calling the Vermont State Police. And uh, um, if, I, you know, I've seen horses spooked and I've seen them go through fences. Uh, I don't know why you would charge somebody criminally for an animal that gets out, that gets out of their fence. Uh, we had a, uh, back in, um, well, there was a liquor control inspector who was driving and hit a horse and died. Hit a horse and died. And uh, uh, I don't believe that uh, they filed criminal charges on the person whose uh, horse that was. I forgot, in fact, I knew the liquor control inspector, uh, but uh, that was certainly an accident and uh, it should be treated as such. I don't know how, uh, how somebody would be charged criminally. Uh, and anyway. Mr. Chestnut Teddy. Like Jonas, I have something of a long experience in that I have been a fence viewer for Middleton Springs, not by choice, and longer than I care to think about. Um, the fact is that as long as there have been farms, as long as people have tried to contain animals, animals have been getting out. Um, I'm deeply concerned at the criminalization of this, that, um, and, uh, and when I heard about this, I did meet with the state's attorney in Rutland to talk about my concerns and, uh, and the criminalization of what I essentially see as a civil um, issue. Um, can't talk too much about an, an ongoing case, but um, I, I believe that uh, when they do discovery, when they review the facts, um, common sense will prevail and it will be a civil issue, not a criminal issue. Thank you. Mr. Rosenthal, do you want to rebut? Okay, um, the next question, I think we've already heard from the candidates their positions on it, but it's on our script, so I'm going to go ahead and ask it, uh, but if you don't wish to answer, you can just refer to your earlier question. What is your position on mandatory reporting checks for firearm transfers between private citizens? Mr. Chestnut Tangerman, you're first. In the interest of time, I think that I'll just uh, say that I, I believe I addressed this earlier. I think there are reasonable exceptions for individual transfers, um, but uh, arm's length transactions like internet purchases um, or gun show purchases, I think, should be subject to the same checks as gun shop purchases. Mr. Rosenthal. I don't believe that, uh, that, that we should require mandatory reporting uh, uh, on firearm transfers, uh, I believe that the I believe that the uh, uh, 
family members that want to transfer uh, guns to their children uh, should not require a uh, mandatory reporting check. Uh, so, in any event. Thank you. Do you wish to rebut? Just to say that the uh, the situation that Jonas just mentioned is one of the exceptions. I, I agree with him on that particular point. Thank you. Do you wish to take a minute? Okay. Um, again, this is a kind of a question that was addressed a little bit earlier. Um, with regard to global uh, climate change, we're finding more damaging rainstorms, wind events, and drought conditions affecting our communities. As our district's representative, what steps would you take to combat uh, these more frequently occurring events? And Mr. Rosenthal, you're first on this. Again, I would uh, point out to the, the Town Conservation Commission officer that uh, posed the question that municipalities have the opportunity to develop their own uh, energy plans. And uh, uh, large or small, if you look at uh, the town of Pulteney's uh, 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 town plan, uh, we address uh, many, many uh, uh, goals, objectives, and programs uh, that uh, deal with energy conservation. And um, also, is uh, one of my other hats as the co-chairperson uh, for uh, emergency management coordinator. The other co-chairperson is the uh, fire department chief. I can tell you, I've been through six uh, federally declared disaster events uh, beginning in 1996. Um, we have taken, um, uh, we have participated with the. Uh, Agency of Transportation on improving uh, some of these, uh, uh, some of the consequences of our uh, disasters, uh, upgrading culverts, uh, doing uh, rock rock lining ditches, and so on. Um, but I believe if you look at our, our town plan, uh, we are actively participating in uh, in uh, uh, addressing these issues. Thank you. Climate change is a, is a very broad issue uh, and needs uh, very broad approaches. Energy generation, energy efficiency, energy conservation is one aspect of it. But the effects of climate change are more about land resiliency, water management, um, and, and uh, adaptation to, to the extremes. Um, approaches include uh, you know, farming practices that keep water from, uh, soil from, from eroding, uh, land management practices that store uh, the, what the land can absorb and retain water, um, both to even out drought and, uh, and flood, but also uh, to, to resist floods, to resist those torrential downpours. Uh, we have uh, increased funding and, and support for regional planning commissions to help deal with this, transportation backups, drainage issues, um, conservation districts, and, and watershed management. Uh, all of these are approaches to, uh, uh, to climate change, as well as uh, disease and pest management. You know, we now have Lyme disease rampant. Um, the, the areas where Insects and, and diseases can flourish is steadily changing, moving north. We have longer disease, longer seasons, more exposure to uh, um, to new diseases and new invasives coming every day. It's it's far more than just energy management. It's a whole look at how we make our landscape more resilient and more adaptive. Thank you, Mr. Rosenthal. Do you wish a minute to rebut? No. Okay. Um, this is our last. Question, um, and I don't know who put it at the end, but I think it's the most important question and appropriately listed at the end. As a legislator, it's vital to be able to work with your colleagues on both sides of the aisle to move a positive agenda forward. Please describe your experience and skills in dealing with conflict among peers 
and reaching compromise in order to achieve productive, positive outcomes. Uh, Mr. Tan Chestnut Tangerman, you're first on this question. Uh, this is a very important question because it informs everything that we've been talking about tonight. Um, it's been said that, that the art of negotiation is letting the other guy have it your way. <laughs> and that really sums up you know, successful uh, negotiation and legislation, which is where you both feel like you have come out ahead. Uh, and uh, in the legislature, that's definitely my approach, is to craft win-win agreements where we both get the essence of what we want. Um, I have a degree in mediation and conflict resolution from Woodbury College, which is something that I get to use every day in the legislature, and often at home as well. <laughs> um, and uh, and it, it brings, being a legislator brings uh, a very different set of skills than, than being a zoning administrator or uh, enforcing or applying law. It's, uh, it's crafting law, it's, it's long-term vision, um, and it's, it's creating agreements with buy-in from all sides. Uh, and I believe that I've demonstrated that ability in the legislature in this, in this last session. Uh, one way that that has happened is uh, I look back through roll call votes. Uh, I voted against the majority 25 times. Fairly independent voter, uh, and the majority being the, the Democratic majority. Despite that, Speaker of the House, Shep Smith, nominated me to attend an Emerging Leaders Conference in Virginia as the only Vermonter there. Um, my first uh, amendment that I proposed and, and passed in the House, five Republicans immediately came over to me and said, that was a good amendment. Um, I think I've demonstrated the, uh, the ability to work across the aisles, to build support regardless of political party, um, and to get things done. I believe in working collaboratively and, uh, and productively. Thank you. Mr. Rosenthal? Yes, I like this question. Uh, as a legislator, uh, back in 1978, I was elected to the State House of Representatives in the state of Montana. Um, served a two-year term in the citizen legislature. Uh, uh, I did my internship in the Governor's Office of Budget Program Planning. I was uh, taking my, uh, M my Master's of Public Administration and uh, program, and I had to do an internship. I got a call from the Governor's Office. Uh, they had a senior, senior budget analyst who was going on maternity leave and asked if I would help put together the Governor's uh, uh, Block Grant Initiative under his uh, Build Montana program. Governor Ted Schwinden, I'm sorry. I didn't mention it. So I said, great, yeah, I'd love to do that. Um, I met with and worked with some pretty amazing folks. Towards the end of my, uh, it was a $48 million package uh, that was introduced in, I forgot what session, it was in the 80, 83 session. So in any event, um, just before my uh, internship uh, was ready to expire, there was a crisis in uh, the state government. There was uh, four murders in Montana State Prison. Uh, I got a call from uh, a friend of mine, well, actually, I didn't even know him at the time, um, and asked if I'd like to work on the governor's, uh, uh, the governor's uh, staff. So I said yes, and I was hired because I knew two thirds of the legislators, and I, my goal, my, my, uh, my. Uh, task was to work with the legislators to get the governor's agenda uh, passed. Um, did that, and then I stayed on for another three years. And if you look at my website, uh, jonasrosenthal.com, look at my testimonials. We'll give you five, it will give you six specific letters that uh, I used to apply for the job as town manager. Those testimonials will tell you what I did and the quality of the work that I did. And I think that tells you, it will tell you uh, how well I worked with other folks. Democrat, Republican, we needed to get things done. Um, I believe that being a town manager for 31 years, attending over a thousand meetings, 
public meetings, select board meetings, planning commission meetings, downtown revitalization committees, committee meetings, uh, the Pulte uh, uh, Development Review Board. I've been there, done that, and I've done it, I believe, very well. Um, I, my goal is to work uh, uh, objectively and to uh, work with both sides of the aisle, and I have the experience in doing it. Again, look at my website, look at my testimonials. Thank you. Thank you. I don't consider this a rebuttable question, so I'm not going to give each of you an opportunity to rebut what the other one plans to do. Um, but at this point in time, we're going to allow the candidates to give their closing remarks. Uh, Mr. Rosenthal went first with the opening remarks. So Mr. Chestnut Tangerman, I'll allow you two minutes to go with your closing remarks. And then Mr. Rosenthal. We've touched on a lot of different topics here tonight, uh, giving an insight into my thoughts and activities uh, as your legislator over the last two years. There's a lot we haven't discussed as well. Um, <coughs> Uh, you can be sure that I have demonstrated the temperament and skills to work effectively, to stand up for Vermonters, not just in this district, but across the state, um, to create a, a more fair and a prosperous economy. A prosperous economy requires doing more than just what worked in the past. What is happening across America is proof of the changing demographics and challenges that we all face. Rural states are hurting all across America. Just, but despite the pain that we're feeling here, we're actually weathering this better than many other rural states are. Vermont still has a triple A credit rate. Um, not many rural states can claim that anymore. And, but we can't simply farm harder to become prosperous. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's not possible for farmers to work any harder than they are already. Isn't that right, Ray? <laughs> uh, instead, we need to be smarter. We need to innovate. We need to adapt to a 21st century economy. I'll continue to work hard to ease the tax burden on working Vermonters, to build a modern economy, including clean energy, innovative manufacturing, broadband, cellular service, and ongoing education to meet 21st century needs. Uh, but I want, do want to talk very briefly about campaigns and about campaign funding. I have about 20 seconds, I think, Jeff. And Citizens United has been the biggest blight on the electoral process of this country. Um, and even now, as we speak, there is PAC money pouring into Vermont to influence our opinions. There's a PAC in D.C. Uh, running negative ad attack ads on the team. Um, and uh, I have vowed not to take any PAC money supported by more than 50 individuals. Um, and I'll continue to serve thoughtfully economically and directly, as I have been. Thank you. Mr. Rosenthal? Thank you. I didn't know that there was any PAC money to, you know, speaking ill of you, I had no idea. But that's not my, I know you, you have nothing to do with that. Sort of with that. <laughs> but I do want to say, um, you know, I've been blessed to have uh, a 31 year career in local government. Uh, my passion is serving the people of this great state of Vermont. As I retire from my job as town manager, I look forward to continuing to serve local government as your state representative. But I can't do it alone. I need your help. Absolutely, no one serves a state representative with the help, without the help of, of uh, their constituents. I will continue to seek your help and I'll bring, uh, begin as I begin my term as state representative. And thank you for taking the time to come out in this uh, in a busy schedule and. Uh, Thank you very much, and have a, have a great day. <laughs>